Content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience, contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, friends, and welcome to Pods of the Multiverse. We are an unofficial D&D podcast where four of us get together and play 5th edition rules in some of our favorite settings. My name is Jeppy, and I will be DMing us through Season 3 in Icewind Dale. And joining me at the table are some of my favorite people. My name is Scala. I play Periwinkle Wuggins, Halfling Bard, responsible for the hit song Rescue Team. <laughs> Rescue Team! Rescue, Rescue team. team! I've been singing that all week. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Andy. I play Everett, the Reborn Ranger, who left his entire history as a person in the hands of a benevolent DM and was not disappointed. Aww. And I'm Jimmy. I play Jib, the sea elf fighter, who's tagging along on this heroic quest to a vengeful demigod's island domain because he's too polite to duck out now. <laughs> <laughs> it's the easiest uh, player character to steer. It's just like a, a whisper of politeness, and then the yeah, yeah. Jib's going to be on board. Speaking of, a lot. Sorry. Speaking of too polite. <laughs> As Jimmy apologizes. <laughs> As Jeffy tries to get our audience to sign up to our Patreon. <laughs> no, I think that was going to be that was going to be Jib politely asking. I think. <laughs> oh well, you know. We know that you hate hearing these plugs every week, so uh, if enough of you would just subscribe or give us money on Patreon, we'd probably stop making these requests. So go ahead and do that. And if you don't, you know, maybe, you know, something else bad would happen, you know, more permanently. Sorry. (laughs) Perhaps you will be sacrificed to (laughs) Oro. Perhaps. All right, all of that out of the way, let's just go right into our penultimate episode of Season 3. Last episode, our party, alongside Kessa and a new frenemy named Sopo, trekked Solstice Isle, the home of Oral, to try and spring a trap on Garen Kang to rescue Denna. After an encounter in an ice garden and a vision from Everett's past, the party found themselves at the foot of Grimstalle, Oral's icy fortress. After a short bout with the formidable Garen Kang, Oral, atop her giant rock, flew from the fortress, landing in the skirmish. Denna then revealed to Everett that two years ago, he was responsible for sacrificing her and her family to Oral, and that she brought him back to repay the debt. Oral, through Denna, then asked that the party destroy Fail Barash on her behalf, as its power continues to grow beyond her liking. All right. So, yeah, we left off with <sighs> Oral on the ground, <laughs> her rock right there, Everett, you... Wink, Kessa, and Denna sit on one side of Oral and her rock, and on the other side is Jib, Garen Kang, and the two Vetus soldiers. And last we left off, Denna had mentioned that it was time to go kill Phil Barash, right after telling you some pretty not chill news, Everett. Whose turn is it? <laughs> well, we're probably abstracting time right now so we can act out of initiative. And We're in the stage of combat where talking is a free action. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. A cutscene in the middle of the combat. I... Man, I sat with this for a week and I still don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, to your defense, it's only actually been three days. Oh yeah, I guess it has. I look up from beneath my hood. It would seem that we have little choice. That I have little choice. But I ask this... I start this looking at Denna, but then by the time I finish, I'm looking at Oral. Okay. What will happen when all is said and done of this? Denna will say, It is unlike her to partake in such rampant destruction. Her recent act in Bryn Shander was out of, well, the closest word would be desperation. Whatever this fail barrage, if I'm understanding her, is a threat to her. A threat that she has never had to reckon with. I don't buy that. Come on now. A threat to her? Oral knows that Fail Barash would never, ever be able to vanquish her. It's a threat to her authority. This is the only home Oral will ever have, and she will do whatever it takes to keep it that way. I don't give a damn about anyone's authority. And Everett, I don't want to speak for you, but neither should you. You said you don't have a choice. You always have a choice. I turn to Denna. I don't know who you think you are, saying that you can offer my friend here absolution. The gods decide what happens to our souls after we die. We get our absolution in whatever afterlife we're put in. I don't think you give a damn about my friend's absolution. I think you brought him back because you knew you needed a tool. But it doesn't matter how a soul comes into this world. When it gets here, it's free. 
You always have a choice. He did. And he does now. What's Garen doing right now? I would say that at this point, everyone is pretty much staring at Oral. I would say that at this time, nothing. Okay. While we're all just staring at Oral and this kind of thing is going down, I'm going to try to put a little bit of distance between myself and Garen. Can I test that out? Yeah. Does he seem like he's going to notice and attack me? Roll insight for him. Would it need to be my turn right now to disengage from Garen and put a little bit of distance between him? I would say right now that's fine. I would say just roll insight to figure out what's going on here. Okay. That's fine. Uh, That's a low roll, though. That's going to be four. Okay. You don't know one way or the other, but you can at least, even just on base perception, he's staring directly at Oral. Okay. He's definitely focused on her, but you don't know what that means in regards to the skirmish that has been interrupted. Then while all this is happening, I'm going to try to disengage and move 10 feet away from Garen, if you'll allow me to actually disengage. You do that, and he doesn't seem to react. He stays focused on Oral. Gotcha. That's all. All this time, I was searching for answers to why I still walked this God's forsaken plane. Not because I thought I had been robbed of a life that I had, whether that was a good life, and I looked to Wink, or a bad life, and I look back to Dana. But from what I can see of this godly power to ask me to do this thing, this is out of cruelty, this is out of malice and hate, and I may have shown that to people when I drew breath, but give me a reason as to why you can't do this yourself. And I throw my bow down on the ground. When I throw my bow down, I look to wink. There will be a moment you'll see Denna nod her head as if in commune with Oral. Perhaps I was wrong. Perhaps your absolution doesn't rest on what happens here with me. But she turns to wink. I think that we could all agree that sparing the people of Icewind Dale, her wrath, is the right thing to do. Maybe you have already found your absolution turning back to you, Everett. So I hope that you'll just do the right thing because it's the right thing. Mm. Everett is shocked and is just staring down at his longbow in the snow. You never answered my question. What will happen to me when this is over? Whatever you choose. I look over to Wink. And what, what about this is the right thing? If all you're asking us is to replace one tyrant with another, we have seen her wrath firsthand. The lives lost, destruction, ruin. How is that any more righteous than what Felborash has done to this place? Kessa will speak to you, her tone very curt with you, Everett. I think what my niece is trying to communicate is that the wrath we saw is atypical of Oral. I've lived here longer than you, long enough to know that the people have grown accustomed to Oral. That is not to say it is the best way, but it is the way they know. It is something they can live with. They can figure it out. What happened a few days ago isn't normal. The way I figure it, there's two tyrants around here right now. So making one less, that ain't the worst thing in the world. Folk wisdom is, enemy of my enemy is my friend, but that ain't quite right now, is it? I'll accept my enemy's help to hurt my other enemy, but that don't make us friends. As you say this, Oral steps away from her rock and extends a hand to it. An authority that needs to legitimize itself through violence was never a legitimate authority in the first place. Oral says nothing, but her gaze fixes on you very coldly. And I'm sure you don't care, but you have to know that that's what happened. (laughs) I mean, should I be making a saving throw? (laughs) I don't think uh, mechanically there's anything in her kit that would do that. Okay. That was more of a shrug, I guess, if I'm dead now. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Like audible Looney Tunes gulp kind of thing? Yeah. Wink's about to be encased in a block of ice. Yeah, exactly. We're gonna have to drag them back to Bryn Shander. You're good. She's just giving you a cold stare. Okay. I put on my bravest face, but I think Wink is a little afraid in this moment. Oh, wow. Damn. All right. Your words, convictions, and tone belay that fear. So good on you. That's awesome. You do say that. She does stare daggers at you, but her semi-winged arm is outstretched, gesturing to the rock as if offering it to you. I looked to Everett. Ever since I stood up out of the cold, dead snow, I did not care for righteousness, heroism, justice only answers. And yet, standing here, seeing what I have seen of this place, these people, in a way, Icewind Dale deserves oral. 
And Everett picks up his bow and starts walking. Towards the rock? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you just walk into the wilderness, which would also be cool, like, honestly. But, uh, okay, cool. <laughs> that was dope, by the way. I don't want to undercut how fucking cool that line was. I follow. I take one more look at Garen Kang, and then I go with my buddies. You do see Garen fists clenching on the great axe, but still staring at Oral. Okay. I attempt to slip away unnoticed. Garen does not for one second give you any attention. Gotcha. All right, cool. Gonna sort of jog and catch up with them. The three of you get on the rock, as do Denna and Kessa, and you do see Oral walk away and start walking towards Garen Kang. Otherwise, the rock is going to fly up and into the sky. I'm gonna watch what happens there. (laughs) Okay. As this rock ascends from the ground you all begin to take flight you're all already looking at the scene below you so you don't need to roll perception on this but you see oral slowly walk towards garen garen begins to charge at her and just before you all head far enough into the sky where mist overtakes you you see her instantly hold out her hand and encase him in ice fuck ah yeah (laughs) wasn't too smart there going directly after oral like that fuck Garen didn't strike me as a particularly smart guy anyway. (laughs) I forgot what his intelligence score was, but anyway, it's no matter. You are all in the sky. You still can see the looming 600-foot-tall ice skull fortress known as Grimscale, but you begin to put it in your rear view as you head towards the shoreline of Solstice Isle. You do see up ahead the Vita ship and your ship moored together on the shore. What are we able to do right now? You have a giant fucking rock. You can do something about the ships, or you can ignore it and fly directly back to Brinchander. This rock is fucking gigantic. Wings spread, it's like 200 feet. So it's huge. I had forgotten for part of that that you were referring to the bird rock. <laughs> was, would you mean like Dwayne Johnson? No, like a, just a giant rock. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> but no, and I, I'm back on board now. It is a bummer that to pronounce the same, and they couldn't be two <laughs> more different things. <laughs> It's pronounced rock, yeah. right? Yeah. Sure. It, okay. I wasn't sure. Maybe it's rock and I'm getting it wrong, but I've always heard rock. I guess what I mean, like, do we have any ability to control this thing in this moment? Sure. Yeah. So right now, Iskra is just heading in a direction, not doing anything. You all are clutching onto the back of this thing. Its feathers are mad enough where you all easily can grab onto it. But you do notice Denna seems to be at the front of this rock and her palms are outstretched. She definitely seems to have some sort of commune with this thing. It's a pretty capable crew. Do you think they'll be okay on their own? I don't know. Don't feel right leaving our people captured like that. So, may I propose another rescue team? <laughs> rescue team 2. Rescue team! Rescue team! I can't believe that this is a running <laughs> gag. It's my favorite one. <laughs> it's the best oh one I've God. seen, without question. It's unsurpassed. This creature is big enough, we could simply capsize their ship. And be on our way. Easy enough. I guess it will say, there are good innocent people on that ship. Would be best to limit the damage. But I'm not sure if that's an option. And Denna will say, Iskra can easily land on that other ship without fully destroying it and hurting too many people. Would that be best? Just take us down nearby, if you can. Denna will rub her palm on this rock in almost a soothing way. And Iskra will swoop down to the ground with a very loud, almost theatrical crash, making a very loud sound as it smashes into the ground in front of the Vita ship, as if to make that presence known. When this happens, you do see the topside crew of the Vita ship run towards the edge and stare at what the fuck all this is going on. And without a perception check, they're visibly shocked and probably scared. And the U-Bow ship is moored to this other ship? Moored to this one, yep. Exactly. Do we see anyone on that ship? No, you'd presume that anyone that was there is in the brig of the Vita ship, probably. Got it. I hop off. When Wink hops off, Everett jumps off, great axe in hand. (laughs) Nice. Jib's gonna get down, too. Who's in charge here? You see a long, blonde-haired elf wiggle their way through this 15 people. For the time being, me. And who are you? I was really hoping you wouldn't ask, because I couldn't think of an NPC (laughs) (laughs) name. You know what? It's not important. We're coming aboard. For what exactly? Well, the leader of your company's dead, which kind of means y'all are out of a job, as far as I see it. Our condolences, by the way. Kessa will step forward. They're right. Garen's hubris led to his death. We witnessed it ourselves. Some of you may know me. I'm from Operation Frostbite. Kessa, if you don't know me, you do now. You've done a great disservice to these people. Despite whatever contract we were under, you should be ashamed. But I understand that our job has often kept us in the dark. 
On your way here, you commandeered a ship, am I correct? Yes, we did. Interlopers. On Garen's orders. We'll be taking those people back. And that ship. And she turns to the three of you. We'll spare you whatever this is. Pointing back to the rock. If you promise to leave here and never come back. Alternative. You might be out of a job now, but we're looking for people that know how to fight. We're going to be taking down the Fail Barrage Company. And there's probably some loot in it for you. If y'all come with us. You hear the crew starts to discuss amongst themselves. You can all roll me in sight at this point. Ah, uh, the halfling that one. Oh. 14. 21. Wake probably with the adrenaline of the moment and the distance between you and the ship. Hard to make out, but Jib and definitely Everett, you can tell the crew is split on this. They're not really sure which way to go. This is all new information. They're also staring down a 200-foot fucking bird monster thing. So you can tell that there's some chatter going on. I would say let's resolve this, Wink, with a persuasion check just to see how many people you banned to your cause. And if you want to say something else before you roll that, you can do it too. Yeah, seeing... Wink try to persuade these people. Everett will step forward next to Wink and say, You all must forgive my companions. They are far too nice. I swing the great axe over my shoulder. This is your last warning. Side with us against Felborash, or... And then I swing my great axe back towards the rock. Suffer the consequences of your actions. And in saying these things, I'm going to try and give Wink the help action. I'll do that. That's fine. Yeah. It felt more like intimidation than persuasion, which is why, but it's all good. I can roll separate. I don't care. No, it's all good. I mean, the question is, does Wink need it? <laughs> but we can... I didn't. I rolled a 14 and a 15. Maybe 26 <laughs> is a break point over 25. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the DC was definitely sub 20. So yeah, good thing you got that help action. You say these words... And Everett, you make your presence and Iskra's presence known to them more than it already was. You reaffirm their suspicion that if they side against you, they side against this giant bird. And between that and what Kessa said and what Wink said, more than the majority of them are in agreement. They're nodding their head and I'll join you. You hear a chorus from a few of them. The elf, not among them, however. And the elf will say, you really just come in here and turn our crew against me? Well, I'm not going to sit in the brig on the way home, so... I suppose you have all of us. That's a good choice. Their intelligence is a little higher than Maury's on the way over. The crew unclutters from the rail of the deck and puts a ladder down to let you all up. I go. We go. Everett follows. Sweet. As you begin to do that, Kessa will say, I think it's best we all stay on the Vita ship on the way back. Go together. Let's make sure our crew is there in the brig. Okay. As you go, Iskra will let out a loud screech and fly back towards the center of Solstice Isle. All right. As we're walking, I lean down to Wink. Something tells me we could have had a faster route to our destination. Or put it another way, we just lost our ability to fast travel. (laughs) (laughs) You press M and the mini-map markers are all gone. (laughs) Yeah, you did. Would have been cold up there. I was going to say something to I'm sorry. Oh, damn. Oh, yeah. Maybe we won't get there quite as fast, but we'll have some more hands with us when we do. So That was a good play. Once again, Wink, you are very wise. I just got away with people. Thanks for your help. Cool. I'll say that as you enter the ship, you're able to confirm your crew alive and well in the brig. You let them out. We're good. We can definitely abstract time here. Just presume it's the same amount of travel to get back to Bryn Shander as it was to get there. So day of ship travel and almost a full day of carriage travel. In that time, however, there's something that Kessa will say to the three of you, but I want to make sure that the three of you also don't have anything you want to do with any of the NPCs that may be aboard this ship, Vetus or your crew or otherwise. Are we getting a whole long rest off of this or just a short rest? Oh, hella long rest. All right. That, I thought that was implicit in the travel time. Sorry about that. You're good. I think Everett finds Jib. Nice. Oh, snuck up on me. Your footsteps don't make any noise at all. It is a trait I have always had. Like always, always, or just in this iteration of your life? I do not know. Oh, all right. Jib. What's up? I wanted to tell you. You fought well against Garen Gang when we confronted him. Well... Well, thanks. It was a shame that Oral saw fit to destroy him before you got the chance to run him through. Jib's eyebrows go up at that. You are a far better fighter than you give yourself credit for, Jib. I uh, appreciate you saying all that. You know, I I don't think of myself as much of a killer, though. You know, someone had to deal with Garen Kang, and kind of glad I didn't have to make the final blow, you know. Perhaps you are better for not having to live with so much of that. 
Things got pretty heavy back there, Everett. Seems like you learned a lot. It would seem as though I did. How are you feeling? I do not know what to feel, to be honest with you, Jib. But if this truly is a way to be free of my past, then perhaps it is worth destroying one evil for another. That's a good way of thinking about it. I know you pride yourself on being a loner and all, but it seems like in this life you got some good friends here. I'll be with you all the way, Everett. And for this, my friend, I am glad. And I think Everett just crosses his arms over the side of the ship and stares out into the sea. Nice. Come on, you two. God damn. <laughs> so, Trub, how's an ogre like you come to be living among little folk? Well, I guess I grew up far south of here, and they had a lot of good food, but not a lot of good people to appreciate it. And that bothered me. So, I heard that there were some smaller towns up north. And I figured it's the north, there aren't a lot of people, and they probably don't get a lot of different foods. And I just wanted to be appreciated. I wanted the food to be appreciated. And no one appreciates food like all these lovely people steering the ship. Well, I certainly appreciate it. You know, I never met an ogre before. We hear all sorts of frightening tales about folk like you. That what you like to eat, well... That you indulge in more, uh, I guess, uh, exotic meats than... <laughs> Ogres, the ones I knew growing up, were passionate people. But if you take your passion and put it towards something better, look, we don't all eat people, okay? Well, again, that's why I'm glad I met you, you know? Dispel some of that strange mythology I had rumbling around in my head. Who is this? This is the chef. This, this is, is the, the cook. cook. This is the chef. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that dialogue went on for that long and Jimmy didn't know who the fuck you were talking about. <laughs> There's an ogre on this ship. <laughs> like, Jimmy, take notes. Okay, wait, how is this plot relevant exactly? <laughs> On the U-Bow ship. On the U-Bow ship, correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, I'm glad I met you too. It's always good to dispel some myths. Speaking of myths, it's a myth how good this soup is. Would you like to try some? <laughs> it's a myth. <laughs> oh, you ain't got to ask me twice. Awesome. If there's nothing else, I'd say the next morning, the ship is deep into the Red Run, the river at this point, and you're making your way back towards Goodmead. You're getting pretty close. Everyone's had enough time to settle in. Eventually, though, Kessa does call you all up to discuss what comes next. Look, I need to be honest with you. Once we get back, I know she won't want to, but I'm taking Denna back to Bremen, away from all of this. We may even leave Icewind Dale altogether. I'm not going to help you with what comes next. I can't put her at risk again. But I know about our enemy. If there is anything you need to know or want to know, I'll do my best. I think that's a good choice, Kessa. I think leaving Icewind Dale is a great idea for everyone. <laughs> Every single person should leave Icewind Dale. <laughs> Spoken from a New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> this campaign made specifically for sick and tired New Yorkers. <laughs> but yeah, we are going to need quite a bit of information about Fail Barash. The man, you know, not the... Well, we could use some information about the organization as well, but... Well, you rooted around their building, but I suspect you didn't find where Fail Barash keeps his most prized projects. Most prized projects? Oh, you mean some of that weird humming lights and those strange machines? Things like that? Things like that. Mm. These are the details I was not kept privy to, and quite honestly, even Garen is not made privy to most of it. Fail keeps his secrets very tight. If there's gonna be a fucking secret lab that we missed, I am gonna be fucking wildly upset. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare to be upset, because you literally mentioned it in the episode, too. It was great. The whole time I was like, oh man. I think we did, right? A secret basement that wasn't on the map. Yeah, there is. And speaking with Denna, this may be part of our problem. Fail keeps some of his closely guarded work underneath his headquarters. Perhaps this is why Oral came, to try and find it and couldn't. I don't know. I'm not confident on the way in, but I do know that it is there. How do you know it's there? Two months ago, I unknowingly intercepted communication between Fail and Garen. It relayed the intent that Simon had insinuated. Keep the people weak. Keep them helpless. Keep them clinging to this idea of fighting and killing Oral. And in that, leverage those people. Leverage 
that need into making weaponry. I don't know what for exactly, but what I know about Fail tells me that he will stop at nothing to grow well beyond Icewind Dale. And if he has to kill hundreds of people to make his business a legitimate empire, he will do it. What a monster. Well, now with Drog and Garen out of the picture, what can we expect in terms of personal security on Fail? I can't say for sure. I would imagine that Rather than the burden of paying someone, he may have his security handled for him through his own creations. But I don't know. Creations? There's another matter. 25 years ago, Tragen was actually a soldier. He was part of the Bryn Shander militia. He supported others. It was predominantly his role. That was the last time the militia ever went and tried to kill Oral. Very few survived. And Tragen was one of them. He came home, scarred from this battle. This is around the same time Fael came to Icewind Dale. And when these two met, it sparked something in them. Fael took Tragen under his wing, and Tragen for a long time, until recently, worked for him. In what capacity? Some sort of management role. I think operations. Something that made sense for someone who came from the war. Mundane evil. Exactly. Mundane evil, positioned as if it was for the greater good. Tragen has spent most of his life vengeful of Oral. After all, she killed so many people he loved. It's sad almost to see him taken over by this fantasy that Fail Barash is selling. I mean, if you think about it, what Fail Barash is trying to convince Icewind Dale of, he convinced Tragen of 20 years ago. She looks down at the ground for a while. I can't judge him. I worked for Vetus, even after they took Denna from me. Everyone's got to scrape out a living. You do what you need to do. Listen, I tell you this because I don't think Tragen's aspirations have anything to do with the election. I think they are entirely centered around Fail Barash. He is fiercely loyal to him. Okay. Aside from Tragen and some type of constructs, what else can we expect in terms of security? She looks out towards the river in the direction of Goodmead. People have a way of falling in love with their masters. In spite of all this, some people still love Fail Barash. Some people still believe it's a comfort, that it's safety. I hope Roman and the others have done what they said they would do with those documents. In my experience, if it's convenient to keep believing the truth you've always believed, people will do that. I just got one more question for you, but it's a doozy. If your goal here is to take down Fail Barash, put an end to the operations completely, what happens to all those jobs? And what happens to all those people who rely on the services that they provide? I wasn't here 25 years ago, but they got by. Yes. I suppose that's what living in the North is all about, getting by. In my experience, people don't need a lord to tell them to take care of themselves and the people around them. They do that naturally. I'm sure we'll find out soon enough if the three of you have any luck. Yeah, so what's going to happen to Vetus with Garen gone? You can understand that I haven't thought about that too much. But now that Denna is safe, while Garen ran the company and Vetus himself is long dead, there are others throughout Faerun work at Vetus and have a vested interest in its continued success. I imagine there will be some, she looks up at the sky, I hope, peaceful transition of power between whomever may be close to next in line, but it is not a line, it's a loop. There are people in a circle all around Garen, and they will all vie for that spot. I suppose peaceful is a relative term in this case. Indeed it is, but I think my time with them is done. It took this for me to realize what was important. Everett, may I have a word with you? Very well. She looks at the two of you, Wink and Jib, waiting for you to leave. Pardon me. Jib will get up and wander somewhere else. You come and Wink? I give a side-eye to Everett and a nod, and then I follow. Once we're out of the room, you know, for all his posture, and I think Everett's good people, I trust him. I think he's on the road to being good people, which is a long road, but I trust him too. Good. We'll see how that turns out for us. Awesome. I felt it necessary for us to speak. I'm sure you can imagine why. There are a great many things I can imagine in this moment, Kessa. What do you wish to say to me? I've spent so long wondering who you might be, wondering who the person responsible was, and the things I would do to them when I found them. And it's you. When I met you in Caradon of All, I could have never guessed that all that vengeance that I wanted to take was right in front of me. Have you ever felt anything like that before? Ever since I woke up, until today, it is all I felt. That and empty gold. The things that I had seen in my mind, in my dreams, at every corner of my eye. Here today I come to learn that my story is not my story. Ironically, it is yours, and I am our villain. What would you have me do, Kessa? Kneel before you, so you can take my head? I'm a measured person, Everett. Vengeance isn't everything. I have seen you fight. 
I know that is not wholly true. You say you feel cold, empty. I'd imagine that before you tried to take my niece's life, you felt other things as well. I do not know what I felt. Exactly. Which is why this is what I ask of you. When this is over, you go find your answers. Come back something closer to a human so I don't feel the need to kill you. But I will tell you this. If you find those answers, you leave Denna out of it. Or I will get my fucking vengeance. She will begin to walk away. Very well, Kassam. If the sins of this place don't kill us all first. She walks away. You make the rest of the trek without any hiccups. One more barrage down the drain, and we're going to start to make our way towards Bryn Shander. All right, you are at this point in the caravan of carriages, just because you've picked up a larger crew coming back with you. Yours, however, is the first in the line. Why don't we, as you make your way into Bryn Shander, go ahead and give me some perception checks to see what you're able to see and hear on the way in? Hmm, it's a nat 20, which is a 22. Okay. <laughs> 24. That is an 11. Awesome. Around you, all of you are able to see this. You see, it's really quiet, but there are handfuls of people picking up the pieces. Some people hammering their houses back together the best that they can, helping others out. Just a small but quiet weirdly quiet rebuild effort going in the outskirts of town. However, Jib, Everett, you definitely hear loud commotion in the center of town. At this point, you are way too far away to know exactly anything that's being said, but you can hear and reasonably surmise that all the people are at the center of town right now. Only a few are staying back and rebuilding what's theirs. What's going on over there? And that noise will get louder and louder. And as you get to the center of town, the people become more and more numerous until you actually see a large, large gathering in the center of town of hundreds of people. It is quite a mess. And there's yelling and arguing all over this groundswell of activity. Let's do one more perception check as your carriage specifically turns and starts to see the outlier of this large circle of people. Nine. Nope. On that first check, could we tell if there were any soldier types around, any Vetus or anything else? You saw no Vetus soldiers, and you also saw no Bryn Shander militia of any kind. You've noticed it throughout. They've been relatively inactive, what with there not being a speaker lately. Mm. But you saw literally no one. Okay. On our way in, I just say, something feels off. Be on our guard. Uh, and I get a 19. Awesome, yeah. Wink and Jib, you can't make it out in the large crowd, but Everett, you actually see towards the center of all of this, you recognize Roman and Tash and Simon, as well as you see a tall, bald, black man with a gray goatee and a few other faces you've never seen before as well. We're always looking out for Isaac in a Bryn Shander crowd. Definitely looking out for Isaac. Everett, you spot probably a couple of people in robes. You don't know if one of them's Isaac or if they're opportunists looking to do something in the middle of all this noise. In familiar looking robes? Plain robes, like the same type. Isaac had very plain robes on. <laughs> okay. But to be very clear, not black cult. <laughs> all right. Still waiting for them to fucking yeah. turn up again. <laughs> and then there's this fourth person who we don't recognize. So yeah, you see a tall bald black man, middle-aged with a gray goatee, and behind him are four others, but you recognize none of these people. Another young, but human female with shorter shoulder length, wavier brown hair. You see a human male, also bald, a half-elf, and then a half-orc female. All four of them relatively young. And are they up on a platform? Everyone's on the ground. There is a space, almost like a school fight in the cafeteria, how people spread out and look inward to this. There's a small gap of people here for this small group. And their body language, Everett, looks to be confrontational, not quite contentious. Mm. And those people we don't recognize, do they seem armed, uniformed? In any way. Everett, you could easily surmise that they're from the militia. You just don't know who exactly yet. They're adorned with a navy blue heavy coat with white fur shoulder padding. All five of them. It would appear as though Roman and his allies have rallied the militia. Should we go talk to them? They don't look like they're too ready to talk right now. Doesn't look like what they're doing is talking. What's better time? A wink? Probably ought to talk to them before they get into a bit more than talking. Talk while the talking's good, I always say. <laughs> Okay, well, you're the expert in talking, so I'll follow your lead. Kessel will say, give Roman my best, and my apologies too. I'm not bringing Denna anywhere near there, and I'm not letting her out of my sight. Again, Kessa, that seems like a really reasonable choice. You should definitely get out of Icewind Dale. (laughs) (laughs) Good luck to you. I've had worse bosses. I hop out of the barrage. (laughs) All right. Bye, Kessa. It was nice to meet you and to work with you, and maybe we'll meet again. It was nice to meet you. All right, bye. 
as I follow Jib and Wink, passing Kessa by. I will not forget what you said. I know you won't. And I keep walking. All right. The carriage, Denna and Kessa inside, moves along. I'd say at this point the crowd is loud, a little rambunctious, but easy enough, almost like at a concert. You can squeeze your way through them. There's not chaos in the streets where you would need to do checks. So I'd say you're able to get into the center of town. As you do, you will hear from this taller black man, the fact that you thought we could keep the peace, and yet you did what you did with those documents. It's, Roman, you have put us in a position I do not want to be in. If you wanted to do this, you should have just won the damn election sooner. To that, Roman will say, I'm not sorry you want to pause the militia while there's no speaker, but the people need to know what's been going on. The people get to have a say in what comes next, and that's all we're trying to do here. You hear those two pieces of this conversation as you step in. Well, howdy! Looks like y'all have created quite a commotion. What's going on here? Simon won't say anything, but we'll look at you, Wink, and just give a smile. And you could tell that it just means we did the thing. Mm-hmm. The taller gentleman will startled look at you. What concern is it of yours? Who are you? Well, I'm Periwinkle Wuggins. And you are? Markham, they are with us. And you owe them a debt of gratitude. These three just saved us from the coldest hell imaginable. And who are these three? Why, we're the cold-hearted bastards. Yes! Fuck yeah. Mm. Well, Roman Tash and Simon over here thought it great to just share a bunch of documents that incriminate Valbarash and make a bunch of claims, and now the entire citizenry is up in arms. Some people are ready to fight and just storm that building, and others are ready to fight the people that want to fight. And we don't have a speaker to tell us where to go in all of this. It's making us look weak. Well, if you need a speaker to tell you right from wrong, then you are weak. That we call a layup. (laughs) (laughs) One of the four people behind Markham will say, It's exactly what I said, Markham. It's exactly what I said. It's the half-elf. Much younger. So, again, Markham, middle-aged. This half-elf, they're probably, for half-elf, in their late 30s. Roman will then say, Markham, this is your job. And I'm not speaker, but if I were, I would tell you to do your fucking job. Get these people in order. We need to talk to these three. They have information that we need. We do? Simon will look to the three of you. Well, you are alive. I presume something happened? Well, yeah, quite a few things happened. Uh, Jib has no idea what to say in this situation. (laughs) (laughs) And how is any of that relevant to what's going on here? And at this, Markham is looking at the three of you and Tash and Roman and Simon for any clue as to why the three of you are relevant. Roman will begin by just saying, we're doing what we can to make sure that Oral doesn't do what she did. I don't see Tragen doing anything. I don't know where Phil Barash is in all this. I know where you are. You're doing nothing. These three just came back from Solstice Isle, alive. So maybe you want to listen to what they have to say. Yeah, well, we've been to see Oral, and it seems like the only way forward in all this is to bring about an end of Fail Barrage. Might not be easy, but looks like what we need to do, you know? Back me up here. (laughs) I look to Lincoln Everett. (laughs) Everett steps forward. Let me put it a simpler way, so perhaps you will be able to understand. Garen Kang is dead. Oral has destroyed him. And the only chance for this town and the rest of Icewind Dale to be saved from Oral's unholy wrath is to remove the sickness that is Felborash. I look to Everett. Can y'all give me a boost so I can talk to the crowd? (laughs) As you do that, you notice immediately the four people that are with Markham look to each other when you indicate that for some reason, Fail's gotta go. That stirs a significant reaction in the four other people with Markham. Jimmy, would you say Jib and Everett are more or less the same height? Jib is tall. Jib's like 6'4". Mm. Oh, yes. So Jib oh, is actually yes. even a little taller than Everett. Oh, but if Everett's over six feet, yeah. you know, they they probably look to be about the same height. Which one of these basketball players do I want to put <laughs> me on their shoulders? I think what Andy's of. getting at is both of them, <laughs> and I'm fucking here for it all the way. All right. I take Wink by the torso and hoist them up so that each one of each of their feet are resting on one of each of our shoulders. Yes. Yes. Human pyramid. Humanoid okay. pyramid. So now you're like eight feet tall. Yeah, eight, nine feet tall. Yeah. <laughs> all right, listen up, all y'all. What are you doing? Well, what my friend said was true. We banned a solstice, and the reason that Oral came here and wrecked this place up is because whatever Fail Barash is doing, it's got her in a frenzy. But you don't need Oral to tell you that this company 
has got to go. I've been around these ten towns. I've seen how you people live. Thel Barash is going to work you, get everything he can out of you, and then discard you to get killed by cultists or get crushed in some mining collapse or get killed by folk that's hiding in the woods. You ain't need no great owl of winter to tell you that this ain't good for you or your people. So if what I'm saying is making sense to you, if you feel like you've been crushed and beaten down, it's time to turn that pressure, that pain into fight and take back what belonged to you. With that, wink, roll, persuasion to see the overall impact this has on the crowd. Okay. I would say we're helping somewhat here. I would say you're definitely (laughs) helping as well. All right. That is a 21. Awesome. Again, throughout your speech, Markham, giving only verbal but heavy protest to your actions. As your speech continued on, you see three of the people behind him go against what he's saying. Let them speak. Markham, you need to stand back. A variety of things in protest of Markham. You've won over most of Markham's militia. As for the people, they are uproariously in support of what you have to say. The crowd cheers. You're damn right we That's will. Right. No yeah. one knows what the yeah. fuck with the North. Yeah. Yeah. The crowd absolutely cheering. Some people like holding up weapons. Some people holding up rakes, shovels, forks. Big people forks. Pitchforks? The pitchfork. That's exactly what I meant. Yeah. Sorry. You know, all those <laughs> kinds of things. And the crowd begins to go absolutely nuts. Markham and his other militia member. Then to the other three, this is not what we do. This is not how we serve the people of Icewind Dale. You hear the half-orc female say, Markham, this is what the people want. You need to earn your fucking place here. Do something about it. The other one that sided with Markham, the human male, says, If you intend to stand against Fail Barash and Tragen, then I suppose we should do something. This human will draw his sword at the half-orc. As soon as those swords are drawn, the crowd will begin to go into a frenzy, and chaos will erupt all around town. At the eruption of this chaos, I'm also going to drop my sword. I hop off of Jib and Everett's shoulders, sword drawn. At this, Simon, Roman, and Tash will come closer to you and huddle, and Simon will start, So are we doing this then? It is fail Baroche. To the three of you, he says this. Nah, I said all that because I was planning on going back home and doing nothing. Wink, you had a sense of humor. I am ashamed I was wrong. It was not the Black Sword cult after all, but this is an evil I am happy to remove from this world. Let us make our way there, huh? Yes. Get moving already. Awesome. You start to make your way through town. The Failbrush headquarters, you know where it is. You've been there before. It is a good 15, 20 minutes away, but the crowd is hard to get through. I would imagine athletics, acrobatics, to like push your way through this mob, so to speak, of people. Some attacking each other, some running towards Failbrush's building itself. Either one makes sense. Okay, you can roll either of those. Does it seem like this has turned into a mob, as in they are mostly all going in the same direction, or is this a riot? So, basically, with Scala's role, Scala convinced a vast majority of the people that Fail Barash is some nasty shit. But not all the militia, not all the people. So, I would say, especially as you get further away from the center of town, it will look more like a formed mob than it will a riot. But towards the center, there is infighting and bickering and actual physical altercation. So, it's more of an uncontrolled riot where you are right now. Okay. I rolled a 23. Awesome. I rolled a 17. Yeah, you're doing fine. I got a 14 athletics. All right. Wow. 20, 19, 20. I got two 20s and a 19. All right. Yeah, all of you remain intact. None of you get splintered off or rolled over. As you see it, and again, you see citizens fighting. At this point, standard militia members are also getting involved. From what you can see, no one is getting killed, but it's a lot of brawling, punching, some militia members restraining people. You know, it's not horrific, but it's not a fun time for a lot of these people either. Let's do another round of these checks as you're making your way further away from the center and towards Fail Barrage. 21. This time I got an 18. 14. All right, cool. Wink. Make me a deck save. Okay. But give yourself advantage. Okay, cool. With advantage, 24. Awesome. It's hard for you in this crowd, and you're getting battered around a lot. You fall to the floor, and before you are completely trampled by a bunch of people, a hand reaches out to you and pulls you up. Oh, nice. I take it. And you hear, we fight power, not people, friend. This fucking guy. Briar! How you doing? And you see Isaac standing above you. My guy. Sweet. So are we heading towards Felbarosh? I couldn't help but notice your speech. I said to Simon just a minute ago, I made that speech because I was planning on just going home and having a nice little nap. You know, there was a day when I would have done the same, but that is not today. 
May I join you? The more the merrier, I always say. Awesome. With that, Isaac joins your group. Pop-up notice. Isaac has joined the party. Yes. And you head out. We'll do one more check, but you notice that it has become less of a riot and more of a mob. It is getting easier and easier to push through these people. Now, remind me, Isaac, does he look like a big guy or not really? No. Okay. I don't know if I described his build when we met him, but Isaac is average build. Because he only had a dagger when we fought him. Sickle. He had a sickle. Oh, that's right. Sickle. Because he's a communist, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> he had a dagger when you left him. Is he armed? He's not revealing his arms, but give a perception check. You're good at this kind of thing. I will. Thank you. <laughs> what a useless nat 20. That's a nat 20. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Andy, the DM player character I have put into this episode has weapons. <laughs> All right. See, I was going to do a cool thing where I toss him my axe, but never mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's why I asked. Your great axe? Because Isaac would not have a lot of use for that. Since you let me have two of them, thanks to Scala. <laughs> All right, cool. Right. I rolled a 17 on this last one. I rolled a 13. 15. Awesome. You all make your way to the front of Pale Barrage headquarters. It's large glass doors closed. You see some boards up at the windows you've exploded on the second floor. <laughs> Feels good to look at your handiwork. And the mob is just standing outside, pounding at these doors. It's getting more and more frenzied. The pounding harder and harder. The glass starting to crack a little bit. Can I just keep hitting it? Yeah. All right. Let's do flat strength rolls to just see how long it takes you all to pound down these windows. It's only a seven. Storm into the building. I uh, use my great axe. Oh, you can use weapons? I'm asking. I mean, I... Oh, yeah, of course you can. The glass isn't going to stop you. And I got a 17. I also got a 17. I got a 13 if we're using weapons. All right, cool. Your friends, not much help, but between the three of you and Isaac, the glass shatters and all of you, at this point probably a good 30, 40 at least, pour into this foyer of Fail Barrage and people start ransacking things and looking for whatever. You don't see anyone in this first room. There's no one there, clearly, because of the mob. But I'd say at this point, people are dispersing enough. You can move pretty freely and go anywhere you'd like to go. So then, his office or the lab? The lab we know about or the lab we don't know about yet? Simon will say, if Oral could not reach this place, do you think perhaps it is underground? Accessible only from the first floor. The R&D was on the second floor, wasn't it? That's right. Well, I think R&D was two floors. It was two stories. Yeah. But Wink will say to this point, they can build staircases three stories tall. This is true. With one of them being underground. I would imagine it is not this easy to access something so secret. You combed this place, did you not? I don't know if combed is the right way to characterize it. It was kind of full of guards and workers last time we were here. We did a bit of snooping. We must keep moving. We could ask for help. That's a good idea, Tash. Anybody in this group used to work at this building? A bunch of people <laughs> stop and <laughs> stare back at you. Yes. Right. Y'all ever see any sort of comings and goings from a place underground underneath here? You see three people step back and all just in unison stare at this female dwarf. And she's like, you know, I guess I saw something one night. Whereabouts? Here, let me show you. And she'll walk into the next room, that large manufacturing plant. And she'll keep walking back to where all that right the site is. In that back right corner, I believe. I think Everett is where you as a guard stole some from people. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. In that back corner, she'll say, one night I saw one of our R&D people. They did something at this machine. And then they just went underground. Mm. Well, thanks for keeping an eye out. What's your name? You fucker. <laughs> 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 you gotta get a good generator or a table or something. I do. I mean, I would argue that I don't because we wouldn't have Flint McRocky and Hammer McNeil yeah, and all those. So. I just use an online generator and I change some letters if I don't just love what I'm seeing. Helpful McNPC. <laughs> The one time I don't set the race, it gives me a fucking construct, and it's Intensifier Primary <laughs> Unit 65Z. <laughs> oh my god. Could you? Do you think this could be one of these constructs that Kessa was warning no, us about? No, no, no. <laughs> Amazing, though. Fucking excellent. My name is Nutella Javinth. Nutella? Shit, that's Nutella, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard, isn't it? <laughs> One more. This is worth the time, by the way. And I kind of want to keep... What was the last name? Just go with the last name. <laughs> I didn't give her a last name. My name is Sienna. You've been very helpful. Andy, are you... I can't see you because you're behind your <laughs> microphone. Okay, there you are. Dying. 
<laughs> behind his microphone dying. I got a fucking random robot name and the Nutella. I, I literally can't right now. It was spelled differently, but like... <laughs> oh. <laughs> My name's Peanut Butter. Was it Nutella spelled with Newt? Like N-E-W-T? It was N-A-T-E-L-O, and it was like male, so I tried to make it female. Oh. So I was like, Nutella. Nutello. <laughs> she just gave you her name. What is it they were doing at this machine here? Did you catch a glimpse of that? It was late at night, and all I saw was red glowing, and then I heard a loud noise, and then they were gone. I told a few people about it, but they never did anything about it. What kind of a loud noise? Like a scraping sound. Mm. All right. Well, let's go investigate. Go ahead and roll investigation. Here we go. It's a flat 17. I got a 10. I'm not sure what the DC is on this. I got a 16, and I am going to add knowledge of a past life to this. Total of 19. Okay, cool. Total of 19, then you are the one that spots it. Everett, you see a large, tall, cylindrical piece of steel where the workers are grabbing rathesite from that has just been processed. So inside of it are some mechanisms that shape it. But what you spot in all of this investigation is towards the bottom of this thing, on the back side, you see a little socket, almost. What have we here? I point it out. I take out my rathesite. Mm-hmm. I look to Wink and Jib. Jib nods enthusiastically. Wink concurs. What a crude secret entrance. And I put the right to sight in the socket. Cool. Nothing happens. The campaign ends. Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me. With music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Subscribe to this feed to get a new episode every month. No. <laughs> you see the right the sight stays a minute and then it begins to glow. This larger structure moves back, and you do see a staircase in front of you. It looks like Walter White was not the only one, huh? (laughs) (laughs) What's that supposed to mean? (laughs) (laughs) If if you're going to be derivative, at least own it, is what I'm saying. (laughs) Ah, yes. The infamous Walter of White. I heard many (laughs) tales on the Black Road. (laughs) (sighs) Anything you want to say before you start going down, though, actually? This seems like the place. <laughs> no. I don't, I don't think anything. <laughs> okay, cool. With that, though, Simon will, will say, wait a moment. Everett, the blueprints you gave us, it is for this thing known as the accelerator. Best we could tell, this device will make the people of Icewind Dale helpless, unwilling to resist. If you see anything of this down below, make sure that Felbrosh is not your only target. Very well. Why don't y'all stay up here and make sure they don't burn the place down with us still inside, huh? You can tell that Roman is very grateful that you said that. Fear palpable in his eyes. Cool. They will stay up top, and the four of you with Isaac will go down the stairs. All right. Awesome. You make your way down the stairs. It is a narrow, almost shaft-like staircase. And as you get to its bottom, we can go ahead and... Give me some perception checks. Is it dark in here? The staircase is, but as you get towards the bottom and from the top, you can see light source. Okay. So when you get to the bottom, you'll be free to look around. Cool. It's a nat one for a total of three. I got a 12. Dirty 20. Oh, and I need to be rolling for Isaac. Also a nat one. Wink, Everett, you notice this first room is quite long. There are no other people of any kind in it. But adorning the walls of this room, you see a variety of... Some things you can confirm to be weapons, other things that don't look immediately familiar to you. All of them seem metallic in nature. A few things may look familiar to you. You'll see catapults that have some adornments on it with more mechanical parts than maybe you've seen before, if any of you ever come across a ballista. But you'll see just a lot of larger scale weaponry against the walls and some that are hung up on the walls. And that's it. You don't see anything else useful. You don't see any desks or anything on the ground in this room. Mm. Any way forward? Other doors? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's probably the most important. Yeah. On the other side of the room, you do see a large door. You could reasonably assume that these larger pieces of what may be weaponry or other gadgetry could have been wheeled in or brought in in some way from these doors. The doors, however, are shut. What are they made of, the doors? They look to be from this side, like a thinner steel. They don't look immovable. Do they look like they slide open on the track, or are they just push doors or pull doors? Every, on your perception, you can see scratch marks at the bottom, insinuating that they're push doors. Yeah, I guess we make for the door. Awesome. Isaac will just ask, have any of you seen anything like this in your life before? Whatever these are. Looks like some sort of siege weaponry. In all my time in Lonelywood, I never knew this is what we were working towards. Well, I suggest we be prepared, but it appears as though we already are. 
Shall we? Awesome. All right, you can make your way. You can give me a group strength check on the door to see if you're all able to push it open. I contribute a five to this strength check. <laughs> Isaac contributes a natural 20 to it. 18, 17. Breath of the Wild, we just did stasis on it and punched it with the axe a few times and it goes flying. All right, cool. In front of you, you see a long, wide, pretty tall ceiling hallway as you make your way down. On the other side of the hallway, you do see an open door. You can give me a perception check to see what you're able to find from this distance before you move forward. 13. 12. 25. Everett, you and Isaac both point out to the party that it looks like desks are in the next room over. You know, you all were exposed enough to some of the gadgetry at the top of the formal headquarter building to know that there may be something, whether it's a camera or otherwise. So why don't you all make me a group survival check and just see how we fare navigating around? Does that make sense? Or stealth? And what else is in this room? Is it the same as the previous or are there different things in this one this is just a hallway getting from one room to the other got it okay and there's no branch in this hallway it's just one long hallway and there's no other rooms along it correct okay cool nine so 15 stealth that's a 21 stealth oh my god easy stealth mod is 10 (laughs) all right rogues Y'all are good. You make your way to the next room over. It's another large room. It's about the same size, actually, as the room you entered in. You see about 10 desks, and at some of them, actually, you see various people. I'd say about six total. A couple of humans and a handful of half-elves and an elf all looking quite scared in this room. Everybody stay calm. We ain't gonna hurt you unless you do something stupid. Who, who, who are you? We we heard there was a commotion up at the top. What, what's going on? Actually, you all can roll me perception real quick. Nat 20. 23 total. 10. Also at 23. Everett, you would remember this. All of these people are dressed like person you knocked out in R&D. Nice. <laughs> They're all dressed the same way. So you could reasonably assume that these are all researcher developers that work here. They asked you who you are and like said that we heard there was commotion up the top. Well, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but y'all are going to be out of a job after today. <laughs> What's going on? What are you here to do? We're closing down this operation. Permanently. But we're trying to help people. Why don't you explain how you're trying to help people and everything else you know about what goes on down here. For a year and a half now, we've been working with Wraithosite. It's just so much work we've poured into it. You can't just come in here and ask us to give up that work. You need to roll persuasion before they'll tell you anything else. Sure. Which you're going to fucking crush, so this is a formality at this point. Well, we'll see. Dice or dice. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but that's a 27. Dice or dice, unless you're a bard, and then dice or dice plus massive mods. After they found it in Termalane and brought it back to us, we realized that Wraithosite has unique properties that allows us to dampen magic and induce pacifism. And we've experimented on creatures. We didn't do it on any people at first, but then we realized that if we kept them close to other people, we could make everybody feel more comfortable and give everybody better lives. That's what Fail told us. I mean, we were told that we were helping people with this device, that this Wraithosite was the key to making Icewind Dale a better place. Do you really want to end this work? Y'all think you're quite clever, don't you? You ever ask yourself a question? If what you was doing was really supposed to be helping people, why you gotta do it in a hidden underground basement? Why not do it out in the open? That's what puzzles me right now. Fail says he likes it down here. This is where he wants the work done. If you knew Fail, you'd know. Can I roll insight? Yeah, you can roll, of course. Yeah. And I love how Wink doesn't roll insight. Wink just relies on persuasion and Everett's always like, I'm rolling insight on this. Yeah, I'm going to roll insight because Everett's starting to think that these guys are drinking some of the juice that they're making, if you know what I mean. That's a 18. Cool. On an 18, you can tell just from their appearance that they've been exposed to Wraithosite quite a bit. You definitely know that they believe what they're saying. The extent to which they're able to believe it may be driven by their exposure to the Wraith of Sight and this idea of pacifism. Seems reasonable. Everett, beneath his cloak, grabs at the Wraith of Sight that he's been carrying for the better part of a week now and considers <laughs> tossing it on the ground. Doesn't, but simply says to Wink, Wink, I do not think you can convince them to leave. We must move on. Hmm. All right. Y'all are so friendly with Fail Barash. Mind telling us where we might find him? They're not even going to respond. Roll persuasion. Sure. 22. Oh, fuck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The game played with dice. (laughs) Okay. You'll need to make your way through manufacturing. After that, you'll come into the accelerator room. But please, don't do anything to that device. We've worked so hard. We've worked so long on it. Fail Barash is probably not far beyond that room. Well, thank you kindly for your assistance. We're going to be going. And if y'all stay out of our way, y'all won't be in any danger. Learning a thing or two from Everett's book. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm just telling it like it is. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, when you came into this room, you see to your left and to your right, there are both doors and they pointed to the left side. Both sides lead to what looks to be the same thing. If you can roll me perception, each of you, I'll tell you what you're able to see through the door because these doors are open at this point. 19. 5. 22. Everyone but Jib is able to see on both sides, actually, you see a similar thing. You see a lot of what looks to be machinery. It looks very similar to the large processing plant you saw up above. And you can see a kind of large landing as you walk the room. And then beyond it, just getting out of your view, a more narrow set of walkways in this room. That's all you can see from this distance. You see that on the left and right, and they pointed towards the left. So it's not that the doors lead into the same room. It's that the doors lead into two identical rooms. When I say identical, like the same shit in it. Okay. And you can roll insight to glean the left or right thing if you want to, because I know you love them. Campaign's almost over, so I might as well give you all the ones you can get. I'll just lean down to Wink and Jib. Should we be going on their word? These rooms appear to be more or less the same. You can roll insight now. 19. With how persuasive Wink was and the way that these people responded to Wink, you actually think that they're telling the truth. You can be pretty confident in going that way forward. Never mind. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) They didn't seem very deceptive. They actually seem pretty proud of their work. Indeed. Let us press on. All right, awesome. You walk into this room and you see right when you walk in, you're standing on a mechanical lift. Below you is some more assembled weaponry. So you could reasonably assume that this is where the weapons get brought to and then taken elsewhere from here. But also you notice there's a walkway in front of you and that walkway goes in and around a few different machinery type parts you see presses pressing things in different sort of cranks dangerous mechanical shit basically now that you're in the room however i do need you all to roll me some perception 16 14 15 okay isaac rolled extremely well so he will point this out to all of you look down below and down below you will see again it's a large space you see some weaponry there some of that larger weaponry that you saw but on the walls and even out from the floor you see something that you've never seen before but you can be very reasonably sure that it is some sort of lethal weapon and it looks to be like a smaller narrower cannon coming out of the ground Mm -hmm. what do we think that they shoot i mean i would say you don't know isaac's just pointing out that there are these cannon things on the walls and pockmarked throughout the bottom layer of this room okay so it just looks like something that would shoot we haven't seen anything like this before yeah how many of them are there i would say the room is about 150 feet on each side so with that along the walls i would say you could see from here 10 like it's a good number and isaac will say it may be easier to navigate around them up top or and he looks to you everett are you a good enough shot do you think we can handle these from afar if you think they will be disabled so simply i have no way of knowing it is easy for me to say let's go topside but maybe some of you are not as sneaky as me yeah maybe if it looks like 150 is the farthest away from one to the other we're possibly going to be then would we be able to just go up top and if any of them start activating or something i could just shoot them there yeah totally yeah just to give you a little more information here mechanically based on your roles what you can tell is that if you were to go at the bottom it would be a lot riskier in terms of getting spotted by these turrets there are some larger catapults and other sort of weapons on the bottom floor so you do see a pathway to get to the other side of this room from the bottom side it just you'd imagine it would be a little trickier stealth wise but up at the top you are going to be walking around some heavy machinery you might have to navigate around that a little bit which might make it a little difficult we have gotten this far without being noticed i mean i think we should go up i'll just say that if i start shooting and i miss then i don't know what's gonna happen okay cool all right you do that for the first third of the room it's just the walkway itself let's go ahead and do a round of stealth checks then to escape the notice of these oh it's just a 10 for me disadvantage that's a 5 18 why are you disadvantaged heavy armor i forgot about that me too by forgot about i mean didn't know same thing it was an at one with disadvantage okay you make your way you get most of the way there but as you do jib your heavy armor your footfalls are not light and fortunately you're at a spot where only two of the turrets are in the nearby vicinity but they do slowly turn towards your direction and let's go ahead and roll initiative as two of these cannon seeming things come at you we rolled that nat one into a 13. 22. 14. What's your mod? Four. Damn, okay. Roll off with Isaac. Okay. 
That's a three. Okay. Easy wins. <laughs> My familiar is at four, but it's just a weird spectral form in the corner of the room, just out of the periphery. Gotcha. All right, cool. We start things off with Everett. There's no surprise around you all. Almost cartoonishly hear Jib make this loud noise. You all turn back slowly at Jib and then notice these two cannons pointing at you. Okay, I'm going to shoot one. Um, I will shoot. All right, sweet. For the sake of simplicity, they're probably 20 feet below you, one on your left side, one on your right side. And they're the same distance from us? Yeah, they're both probably about 20 feet below and then 30 feet away. Okay. Easily in your range and for most spells as well. Okay, here we go. And that's going to be a 25 to hit. Yep. I don't have sneak attack, but I do have dread ambusher. So first hit, that is 14 points of piercing damage. Awesome. And then I'm going to shoot again with Dread Ambusher. And that's a dirty 20 to hit. And that is six points of piercing damage. Awesome. Yeah. You loose your arrow into this thing. And you notice that it's not fully effective. It definitely does pierce into this thing, but it doesn't go all the way through. Okay. Bonus action. I'm going to try and find some place to hide nearby. Yeah, roll stealth. There's plenty of heavy shit around here that you can hide behind. I got a 29. <laughs> Wait, what did you say you got? 29 on a 19. No, it doesn't find you on a 29. You're hidden. That's my turn. All right, sweet. That's your turn. Everett, the same turret you just fired upon is going to fire at Jib. That is a 17 to hit. Hits the shield. Just barely. Jib got the shield up just in time. Damn, cool. Forgot how fucking high your AC is. Yeah. It's insane. As you raise your shield up just in time, you see a small cannonball. Jib would maybe reckon this is, but it is definitely made of metal. Okay. All right. The turret's turn. We go to Isaac, who's not much fucking use in this situation at all. I guess Isaac will look to you, Wink, and say, I hope I will have put this to good use, showing you the dagger that you gave to him. And he's just going to try and throw it at the turret. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay, yeah. He hits on a 17. Not bad. He does six for a total of three piercing damage against this thing. And that is his turn and jib. All right. I'm also not much use in this situation. My range attacks aren't that far and I can't even get down there. I think I'm just going to use blade ward as my action. Okay. What does that do for those who do not know? The listeners, obviously, I know. (laughs) Until the end of my next turn, I have resistance against bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage dealt by weapon attack. Oh, that's cool as shit. I like that. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah, so just resistance on physical damage until my next turn. Nice. I raise up my shield, and it glows a little bit. Jib's turn, we go to Wink. Okay, I'm going to look at this strange machine that Everett shot a couple times, and I'll begin again picking out a really, really fast tune and start shooting off some sparks from my fingers. And as I do, you can see the metal of this weapon begin to also glow with a bit of red as I heat metal. Mm. So actually, I did some reading on this. Okay. My understanding and what I have read online is that heat metal, the wording of the spell is like an object worn or used. So if it is like a construct or something like that, it can't just be done on it. It is a manufactured metal object such as a metal weapon or a suit of heavy or medium metal armor is what it says. So if this thing has some weapons protruding out of it, I am heating the weapons, the guns that are protruding from this construct. You can rule against that or not, but I would say if a construct is carrying a weapon, that weapon is not part of the construct itself. Yeah, I'm struggling with this one because I figured this would probably come up. Again, whatever ruling you make. What I'd like to do, if it's cool with you, is the damage is the damage, you can do the damage. And if you maintain it for long enough, eventually the weapon will wear. So it may not be an instant disadvantage. If you're cool with me changing mechanically how heat metal works. Yeah, again, this is a unique circumstance, so I'll leave that up to you. Sweet. Well, it takes seven fire damage. All right, all that adjudication, only for us to get to this point. Wink, as you start to burn at this, this thing glows red, almost turning to magma itself. Please tell us a tale of how turret on the left side came to fall in Icewind Dale. Yeah, so left turret, the barrels of these guns just melt shut, and it goes to shoot again at whoever it was going to shoot at, and it just (laughs) blows up. Awesome. (laughs) Awesome. Love that. Cool. You do that. Anything else from you? 
bonus action, Bardic Inspiration for Everett. Oh, no shooting machine could aim quite as true as my good buddy Everett. You see this one through. Oh, yes. <laughs> nice. Hella Bardic on Everett. It's a D8 now, just so you know. Nice. Ooh. And you can add it to damage or AC, right? Damage or AC. Damn, Damn Valor yeah. Bard. Damn fucking Valor Bard. So good. Oh, it's so good. All right, that's the right turret's turn. It's going to go at fucking Jib again because Jib made the noise. I have to be true to the turret. Sure. Final dungeon, you think, would have some tough encounters, but it rolled a nine. Plunk. Plunk. It hits the banister of this walkway. Oh, yeah, it doesn't even hit Jib's shield. Just it doesn't even hit your shield. Man, I love these cartoonish fucking combats I keep designing. Anyway, <laughs> that's its turn. Familiar, what's the familiar going to do? Make you more capable of killing this thing quickly. Yeah, familiar is going to use its spectral motion to give Everett the help action, guiding his eye. Not going to need it. You already have advantage? I'm coming out of hiding. It's the best part about this familiar is every combat. It's like, <laughs> nope, everyone has advantage. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I could give that advantage to Wink. Yeah, I've got some attacks I can make. Sure. All right. Glad to see you ain't hold what <laughs> happened last time against me, little buddy. It doesn't respond to that. It kind of just twinkles here in the room. It's flying around in this room. Doesn't look natural for a bird of this size, of this wingspan, to be flying around in a room like this. But here it is. Everett. Your turn. Okay, I'm gonna come out of hiding and attack. As my bonus action, I'm gonna cast Hunter's Mark, and here I go. That's a 19 plus mod to hit. Yep, it's. I am going to go ahead and add that Valor Bard dice to this damage roll. 21 damage total. Nice. Okay, awesome. Again, the arrow hits into this thing, but doesn't go quite all the way through. But you can hear the impact noise. It was a good hit. That's my turn. For sure. Awesome. That is your turn. The other turret is dead. We go to Isaac, looking down at his knife. I will miss that thing, but why did I not think of this before? Isaac has fucking second story work. Isaac's just going to jump down <laughs> from this walkway, gracefully land, roll, and dash in the direction of this cannon. And you see Isaac, Everett, not surprising to you because you spotted all of his weapons, but unsheath a new shiny rapier and just jab into this thing right into its little cannon hole, hopefully, <laughs> on a... Uh, He's like misses. Uh, <laughs> shouldn't have went for the cannon hole, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that was my big mistake. Close quarters for next time. That's Isaac's turn. <laughs> All right. I really hope my rolls fucking improve <laughs> for everything. That's Isaac's turn, Jib. Jib's going to blade ward again. Not doing anything. Cool. Okay, awesome. Wink, I think you have the help action from this familiar. Yeah, I'm going to take one of my knives and throw it at this thing. All right. Following Isaac's lead, but I think, based on the distance, if it is 20 and 30, that I would just be making a flat roll here with a thrown dagger. Yep, it's 21 to 60 feet. Yeah. You'd be right. So, that is still a 22 to hit. Yep. Nice. Yep, yep. Okay. So that's going to be a maximum of eight piercing damage. Awesome. Sweet. The knife smashes off of the turret. It doesn't stay embedded, but you'd notice where it was left. A good ding in this thing. And it's starting to spark a little bit and smoke. All right. That's your turn, Wink. We go to the right turret. Right turret is going to go for Isaac because Isaac came right in front of it. All right, that does hit... It's 11 bludgeoning damage to Isaac. Cool. That is the turret's turn. We now go to the familiar. All right. Familiar is going to swoop down and give Isaac the help action this turn. Thank you, friend. Awesome. We go back to the top, Everett. I'm going to shoot it again. That's a nat one for a total of 10. Shit. I should have given it to Everett. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's all right. Oh, Everett. wait. No. Oh, I could have bonus action hit and then attacked. Nah, it's fine. Isaac wouldn't mind a shot at redemption. I shoot Miss Wildly, say, I'm beginning to care too much. I think about other people. I should see to this. <laughs> and I will hide again. Okay, cool. I got a 14. I rolled a nat 1 and a 4. Ooh. Those might be the lowest consecutive rolls I've had all campaign. Oh, guess what it rolled? What? A nat 1. Wow. You're hidden. <laughs> all right, awesome. That is your turn, Everett. We go to Isaac up next. We'll roll with advantage. Get it right in the cannon hole this time, buddy. <laughs> He's definitely going to get it right in the cannon hole. He rolled a 21. He lifts up his rapier, determined, and then jabs it directly into the cannon hole this time, striking true with 10 total piercing damage, and even cut down to half. Isaac will tell you a tale of what he did. We exit initiative, Isaac comes back up. Did you see what I did there? I stabbed the cannon hole and it exploded. Good job, Isaac. First good thing he's done. <laughs> Alright. Try not to make too much noise next time. 
<laughs> awesome. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and keep making our way here. Are we leaving this room? No, no. That happened because you made noise going through the room. You're still in this room. Oh, okay. I see. Okay, you make some more progress through this room, and you notice that the walkway is a little bit of a break in it, and you see almost like a mechanical dumbwaiter system to bring small parts up to each side of this walkway. So you'll have to navigate through this thing carefully. It's not just like a simple walkway. So I guess acrobatics would be the way to resolve this, to see how well you can navigate around this mechanical pulley system. 13. 14. Only a 12. Okay. Wink, can you give me a deck save then, please? Sure thing. 17 deck save. Awesome. Also give me a stealth check, actually. 13 stealth? Okay. You lose your footing for a moment. You know, you're starting to cross over this pulley system and you almost slip and fall down below, but you're able to catch yourself at the last minute and you make a little bit of noise, but for the time being, nothing in the room has seemed to stirred back awake or reacted to that. Woo! This place sure could use some sort of, somebody to administer some sort of occupational safety and health. (laughs) (laughs) You can move onward the walkway in front of you. Clear. You can see the door ahead of you. You're about halfway now. The door ahead of you is open. You can give me a perception check to see what you see inside at this point. I got a 14. I got a 10. 13. He's got an 8. Everett, you can relay to the party that you see faint red coming from the next room, but you don't see much else at this point. There's a lot going on in this room. There is a red hue coming from the next room. Perhaps uh, more Wraithasite. All right, awesome. Again, about halfway there, you don't see any large machinery in front of you. The path ahead is pretty clear. It's a matter of getting there without note. Let's go ahead and do uh, one last round of stealth checks here. Oof. Jib should let his familiar give him the help action. That's a good plan. <laughs> Didn't even realize I could do that. That's right. Okay. I'm going to do that. That's a 19. Can you describe it? I'm not saying you can't do it, but I would love to get this flavor. Well, the familiar has a way of staying in the periphery of at least my sight and sometimes others. And so if I try to follow it, it can show me places to be less noticed in okay i really like the mythology of this familiar's object permanence or object impermanence in this case (laughs) yeah it's like only there sometimes yeah (laughs) not in like a oh we forgot about the familiar sort of way but in a when jib doesn't perceive it does it exist kind of way that's right yeah Yeah, exactly yeah anyways i got a 17 the lowest i can roll a seven He's got an 18 on the dice for a total of 28. It was a group roll. Y'all are good. (laughs) Awesome. You make your way into this next room. Let's go ahead and roll me perception. I'll tell you what you find. 21. 21. Natural 20. He's rolled 14. All right, cool. Those are fucking good rolls. Oh my God. About time. Okay. Immediately in front of you, you see a few things. It's much smaller than the other rooms, probably about 50 feet lengthwise in front of you. The first 20 feet are made up of a large glass and then also steel bar encased area. That's at the far end of this room. And in front of that is like a large wall to wall desk. At that desk, you see another person appears to be dressed like the scientists from the other room. You just see their back slouched over as if they're crying. And in front of you, behind that encasement, you see a mechanical pillar and in the center of it, a small device. Everett, you would immediately recognize this as the device that was in the blueprint that you found. It's a small pentagon-shaped object. It would probably be a little too large to hold in one hand, but any of you could easily cup it in both of your hands. And on that device affixed to it, you just see a lot of red liquid pouring in and around it through various tubes. Mm. Glowing red? Yes. This is probably heavily processed and maybe even melted down Wraithosite. Okay. So not blood. Correct. Yes. The other red liquid. I always forget there's an other red liquid that's very popularly used in D&D. Boy, that would have been a turn here in the end of this campaign. That would yeah. have been awesome. No, it's right the same. It's right the same. It was blood the whole time. It was blood the whole time. I mean, that was a working theory I had for a little while. Was it really? Yeah. When we get to the season wrap up, I think it has to be eight hours because seven hours will just be your notes. <laughs> I think we have found the accelerator. It is the same as the descriptions I found before. This scientist in the room, they don't seem to be reacting to our entry at all. So as you enter, they're heaving and sobbing and you hear them begin to speak. This work will be ruined. They'll ruin this work. And this work was so important. And the scientist will turn around. You came to ruin our work? I mean, yeah, if that's how you want to describe it. Sure. How far away are we from the entrance of this room to where they are standing? 
So you're in the entrance of the room. So they're 30 feet away from you because they're at the desk up against this encasement. Got it. Get out of our way and you will not be harmed. But do you know what this thing is capable of? What it can do for Icewind Dale? What it can do is immaterial. As far as I see it, what it will do is make people into slaves. And that's something that I personally can't abide. Everett's gonna draw his longbow. How thick does this encasing that it's in look? Quite thick. Just out of curiosity, how would you describe what this is capable of? I don't think it's been properly described to us yet. We were told that so long as the people of Icewind Dale kept this device close at hand, there would be peace. And you want to come here and destroy it. Are you telling me you don't know what it does? I know exactly what it does. And I know that you are not simply going to loose an arrow into it. You'll need a key for what you're trying to do. And that key is held by Fel Barash himself. And as this person says this, will actually turn into Tragen. What? And ready an attack at all of you. Oh, yeah. it's disguise <laughs> self. How cute. Technically something else, mechanically, but same effect. Mm. Ooh, is Tragen a doppelganger? No, no. That's Mantle of Whispers. It's a... Yup. Yup, yup. I forget which subclass bard. Okay. Yeah, Whispers bard. Yeah, Mantle of Whispers. So we'll all roll initiative. Okay, well. No. Oh, fuck. Another nat two. I got a nat two also. Total of six. Same. In any situation, Wink should go before, I think. As a bard. Okay. I'm really blowing these nat 20s on things that don't matter. 24. Okay. And then Familiar. Familiar's at 12. You know, you still didn't answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a perfect segue into combat music. You have no idea. Well, it's simple, really. You put this in the hands of everyone in Icewind Dale, and all they have left to defend themselves with is Fail's weaponry. Who's going first? Talking's a free action, right? Yeah, but if it's not his turn, I'm going to interrupt him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're going first on a 24. Okay, I interrupt his exposition to shoot him in the face. <laughs> Roll attack for me. I'm going to bonus action hide behind the door that we just walked in, if I may. It opens inward, so actually you can try to do that. I got a 25 stealth. Very unlikely here. You good? And I attack. There it is. There's the nat 20 that counts. All right. And here we go. 31 points of piercing damage. Awesome. That's the way it should be. But people don't realize that fail. And as he begins that sentence, an arrow just flies into him and he is completely interrupted. Didn't notice you hiding because was busy with his whole spiel. Everyone here talks too much. <laughs> and I look to Wink and Jib. That is your turn, Everett. We move to Isaac's turn next. Isaac will run right up to Tragen. You were part of this that took everything from us. And we'll also hit for five piercing damage. Yeah, the lowest boss. Oof. So much for Blood Red Vengeance. All right, that is Isaac's turn. We move to Trey. We'll just cast fear on you, Everett. Okay. You're so worried about people talking too much. You're afraid that maybe you'll have something to say that you can't deal with, some truth you can't handle. Just to point this out, that's a 30-foot cone. That would hit all of us. Great. Even better. <laughs> Thank you, Scala. Scala, attorney at Rules Law is a neutral party. I need you all to make a wisdom saving throw. Okay. Brave. Finally coming in handy. I make this with advantage. Nice. nice. 16. 19. Oh, boy. I got a 10. Ooh. Okay. Everyone but Wink grows fearful. Whoa. Yeah. All of you grow fearful. And let me see. Disadvantage on checks and attacks while in line of sight. Can't willingly move closer. Yeah. And while frightened by this spell, creature must take the dash action to move away by the safest route available on each of its turns. Shit. All right. That's Dragon's turn. We move on to the familiar. Familiar also should have rolled that. Just a second. 17. Just passes. Okay. The familiar is going to give... Give Wink the help action. Cool, cool. All right, awesome. That is Familiar's turn. We move on. Perfect timing to Wink. And how far is Trigon away from us? 30 feet from even Andy, actually. So the only person up close is easy. Everyone else is 30 feet away. Okay, cool. With my 25 feet of movement, can I get into melee range? Yes, you can. <laughs> okay, I do that. Just a logistical question. Which of you is going to have the hardest time making a wisdom save? I had four. I minus one. Okay, cool. All right. So the attack roll is a 17 to hit? Just hits. Okay, cool. So that's going to be seven points of piercing damage. Does have to make a DC 10 concentration check to keep concentration yeah, on the fear. 13. Okay, so that's still going, but... 
I will offer to Jib as a bonus action some bardic inspiration. Hey, Jib, don't be afraid. Come give this Tragen a taste of your blade. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> D8. Nice. Cool. Jib, you're up next. Okay, so I'm running as fast as I can back out of the room. That's 60 feet, but I feel I am out of line of sight after I leave this room, right? I can get to a safe seeming place. Yeah, you'd be out of sight from Dragon. Yeah. Okay, because that is in the wording there. So I'm out of line of sight and I'm going to make my wisdom saving throw. Yeah, nothing else I can do. And I'm going to use the bardic. That's probably still not going to do it. That's 15. That's, that was a very low D20. Yeah, that does not do it. <sighs> oh, no. Jib is cowering in the other room now, in the hallway. Yeah, we're back at the top, Everett. Okay, I dash, and I guess I make my save. You can't do any bonus actions or anything, right? I think you can. Regular fear you can, but this is fear spell. You literally have to take your turn moving away. No, I think you can take a bonus action. You just have to use your action to dash. Then I'm going to hide again. But we also dropped our weapons. Did? Yeah, you drop what you're holding. <sighs> okay. Oh, and then as a bonus action on my turn, I'm going to have my weapon come back to me. Hell yeah. Ah. So good. Eldritch Knight. Yeah, Eldritch Knight. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool as hell. But my shield's still on the floor over there. My stealth check is a 23, and then I make my wisdom save... Okay, I think that'll do it. That's an 18. Yeah, that passed. You're no longer feared. That's my turn. Awesome. All right, I think Isaac. Yep, Isaac's up next. Isaac drops his weapon and books it, and then Isaac will do the same. No, <laughs> not even close. Four doesn't do it, turns out. All right, awesome. That is Isaac's turn. We go to Tragen. Before we go to Tragen, actually, what will happen next is you will see up in the top left and top right corner wall of this room, one of the tile walls shift down and two turrets will come out and roll into the initiative order. You can run all you'd like, but there's plenty of me and these to go around. And actually, the left side turret will go next. Who the fuck is even left in this thing? Wink is the only one left in this room now? Unless, no, yeah, I think Isaac just ran out too. All right. And Wink, correct me if I'm wrong, you went into melee range, right? Yes, I did. Nice knowing, y'all. Oof. Yeah, so it's going to fire at you, Wink, for... It's a now. Jesus, wow. Nice. Turrets. <laughs> These fucking turrets are ridiculous. <laughs> well, they were made by Felbarash, so obviously they malfunction. All right, we go next to Tragen. I don't think you realize exactly how much of a gift Felbarash has given this place. And he will actually just attack you. Wink. An 11 doesn't hit, right? No, it does not. What weapon is he using to attack me? Oh, right here. Cool, I parry it with my rapier. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Hell yeah. We're into some real Arrow Flynn shit up here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love that. Awesome. We can do this dance all night, but the reality is that you nor anyone else really deserves what we are giving you. We are giving you peace against Aura. As I shove his sword out of my face, I retort, Peace don't matter unless you choose it for yourself. Tell that to the people who Icewind Dale betrayed and left to die. My friends, we didn't have a choice. At least Fail gave us something. Fail is our savior. And we will move on to the familiar. Familiar's gonna keep giving Wink the help action. It's gonna stay in that general area. Awesome. Right turret. Let's see if I can get a double digit fucking roll for attack on Wink. Okay, yeah, this probably hits. 18. That hits. Okay, and that is 8 bludgeoning damage. <clears throat> Wink, you're up. Okay. How far away from me are these guns? The room is no more than 20 feet wide, so they're both 10 feet away. Okay, cool. Are you doing some thunder shit? I might be doing some thunder shit. Hell yeah, you are. Pointing it so I can hit both Dragon and the gun that shot me. They roll constitution saves. I think they probably both failed. Trigon got a 14 and the turret got a 4. Yeah, DC's 16. So they both take 7 points of thunder damage. And Trigon is pushed back 10 feet from me. Cool. And needs to make a concentration check. Oh, right, of course he does. 17 on the dice and he passes. And you can't take an AOO. If you'll allow me to take an AOO, I will. I'm pointing to Scala rules law here. Is there a reason you wouldn't take your own AOO here? So AOOs on force movement are already a house rule we've been doing. Okay. So if you want to deny that for any reason, like it's your spell, you can't react to it, that's your prerogative. No, I would say it would strategically make sense for you to say, I'm going to push someone so that they're distracted enough to take a blow from my sword. Absolutely, you can take an AOO. Cool. Does a 14 hit? No, it does not. Yeah, I didn't think so. I try to follow up my thunder wave with a stab, but Trigon's already out of my reach. Damn short arms. <laughs> okay, Jib. All right. Uh, Jib runs away from the action. <laughs> So I'm 90 feet away from Tragen, and I'm going to make my wisdom save. I don't like these odds. It's not good. No, five. I'm surprised you didn't give the familiar giving you the help action. 
Can't use it. On saving throws. Jib, you remain fearful. We go back to the top with Everett. Okay. I am hidden. I move back up behind the door, pick up the bow, and I'm going to shoot him. Okay, gotcha. Before I attack, I'm going to cast Zephyr Strike. This is giving me advantage on the attack. It already does that, but it also adds some damage. Here we go. That is a 22 to hit. Does. Very good. 22 points of piercing damage, and he needs to make a concentration 11. Okay. Nope. Six. Doesn't do it. Very cool. Jib is no longer feared. Yes! All right. Welcome to the land of not being feared. And I will, for the sake of getting out of line of sight of the turrets, move back behind the door. That's my turn. All right. Next is Ezek. Ezek's going to go back up to Dragon and go for an attack. And will hit, actually. Get him, Ezek. Doing seven points of piercing damage to Trace. That is Ezek's turn. We go to the left turret. You weren't able to hide, right, Everett? Because you used your bonus action for something else. Zephyr Strike, I think? That's right. Okay, yeah, so the turret is going to come at you, seeing that you are the most formidable threat to Tragen. It's probably not going to hit. Does a 14 hit? I move behind the door and dodge the attack. Tragen's next. He's going to stay where he is, and he will cast Confusion. It'll be on Wink and Ezek. And it's a wisdom save. Okay. Nope. Ezek's confused. I don't think a 15 does it. It does not. Oof. All right. Wink and Ezek both confused. All right. And that'll be Tragen's turn. We go now to the familiar. Seeing this, I'm going to will the familiar to give Everett the help action this turn. Cool. Awesome. And then the right turret will again fire at Everett. There we go. It's a 19 to hit, Everett. I know you're behind the door, so you add two to your ADC. Does that still hit? Yes, it does. That is a total of 12 bludgeoning damage. Awesome. That is that turret's turn. We go to Wink now, who is confused. Okay, let me roll my D10. I move in a random direction. (laughs) Oh, boy. So now I'm going to roll this D8. I'm going to say one is toward the door we came in, and then going clockwise from there. Okay. I push down right on the thumbstick and run into that corner. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I'd say if it was a one, a two, or a seven, it would have provoked the AOL, but you're good. All right, awesome. Wink, it's your turn. Oh, and I get to make another saving throw at the end of my turn. Oh, cool. What? No. (laughs) (laughs) The the dice just says no. The dice says no. (laughs) Jib, your turn. All right, Jib stops running in the opposite direction, and he... Turns around and starts running back towards the action. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) So he runs 60 feet closer to Tragen and on his way as object interaction is going to pick his shield up again. Cool. Yeah, that's right. You would have done that the last 10 feet of that journey. You grab your shield. AC intact. And uh, and back at the top. You know what? I think. Sorry. Well, I use da- I use my action to dash. I suppose you should still have a bonus action. Right. I don't really have any bonus actions, but I could action surge and take a range. Should always do that. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna action surge. I'm gonna pull this light crossbow off my belt and take a shot. Seventeen to hit. Hit. That's the way. For nine piercing damage. Holy shit. He's just as good at this as he is with his sword. Make a concentration check. 14 total. Okay, okay. Confusion holds. I attack twice on my turn because of extra attack. That one's an 18 to hit. Hits. Nice. For, ooh, 12 piercing damage. Four. So I fire off these two shots real fast as I'm running back up. I'm sorry, friends. I'm sorry. Lapse in judgment there. I'm back. (laughs) Love it. Tragen looking very hurt. Tragen making another concentration check. Tragen taking another concentration check. It's a 19 on the dice. Okay. Now we're back at the top with Everett. Okay. Bonus action. I hide. I roll a 24. No. Doesn't see you. I see Jib come up and attack. And we are glad to have you with us. And I attack as well with a 18 to hit. Hits. And this is... 14 points of piercing damage. Just wanted to pull up confusion because Ezek's coming up next. Well, make a concentration check. Maybe it doesn't hold. Oh, that's true. It holds. It's 15. Okay, Tragen is looking extremely, extremely hurt, by the way. And then I will move back into cover. Awesome. Ezek's turn with confusion. We'll roll. Ezek's confused and just stays there staring blankly at Tragen. This guy. That's Ezek's turn. Ezek would get to make a new save at the end of his turn. Oh, cool. No, easy does not save. Left turret goes next and will attack. Jib just walked into the doorway. Let's go for Jib. 
A 23 hits, right? Mm. Oh, it does no matter what. Yes. Even with shield. 23 is my ceiling. Okay. Okay. It's 11 bludgeoning damage. Ooh. That's the turret's turn. Next is Tragen. Who will attack... Ezek's confused, so couldn't make an AOL, right? Yeah, you can't take reactions while confused. Trigon will spend the movement then to get to you, Wink. You can deny what I'm saying all you'd like. You can keep fighting, but eventually there will be no fight left in you, especially with our device looking to the accelerator. And we'll make an attack against you. A 22 to hit. No, too high. Okay. He will expend a bardic here to use psychic blades. Yep. And that is 19 total piercing damage. Ouch. And that is Dragon's turn. That's the familiar next. Familiar is going to give me the help action this turn. Nice. As it was intended to be. Yes. All right, cool. The right turret up next. Also going to zero in on you, Jib. Is, no. Uh, ten does not turn. Nope. All right. That is the turret's turn. Wink. See what this D10 says I do. Nine. Creature can act and move normally. Hell yeah. Yes. All right. Here we go. Just for this turn, right? Doesn't end the effect. Yeah, just for this turn. It doesn't end effect. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. So, Tragen just came up and stabbed me. Yes. And I'd say from where you are, the turrets are 20 feet left, 20 feet right, and Tragen's in melee range from you. Okay. As he pulls his sword out of me, I'm just going to clap my hands around it and stare Tragen down really hard. And I'm going to cast Heat Metal at third level. Nice. Nice. So, con save from Tragen. Probably not. Ten. Yeah, definitely not. So first he takes, oh Jesus, 21 points of fire damage. And then he drops the sword. Wink, he does drop the sword because please tell us a tale of how Tragen came to fall in Icewind Dale. Nice. Yeah, so I grab this sword and I start channeling this teak metal spell through it and his arm just catches fire. And then the rest of him catches fire and he flails around on the floor. Until he is not put an ashen mess. Hell yeah. Awesome. Tragen, without a word, perishes in front of you. Your confusion and Ezek's confusion both disappearing entirely. After this, you notice that both those turrets that came out of the wall go back in and the wall's shut. We exit initiative and you hear from the ceiling the familiar voice of Felbarash himself. What a fucking disappointment. Not just Tragen, smoldering fool, but the three of you had such potential. I suppose we'll have to see what exactly that potential may be worth. Please, whenever you're ready. And to the left, a door will open. And you can see inside, no perception check, you can see a shaft. Big enough for large machinery or yourselves to walk into. Also, you all level up. Nice. Nice. Splendid. And as the door opens, he has beckoned you inside, tells you to take your time. That is where we'll end this session. Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me. With music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Subscribe to this feed to get a new episode every Monday. Check out the links in the show notes. You can support us by visiting our Patreon, joining our Discord, or sharing this episode with a friend. We want to give a special shout out to our Holy Avengers, Jake, May, and Chris. For $10 a month on our Patreon, you too can become a Holy Avenger. Thanks for listening.